Hello and welcome to Roundtable. Boris Johnson's ability to connect with an electorate with which he had little in common made him a vote-winning machine. His ability to swat aside scandals that would have taken down other politicians was appealing to his colleagues. But after winning a huge parliamentary majority three years ago, the toxicity of his leadership finally became too much for his colleagues to bear. It's all over, Prime Minister. Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. The first UK Prime Minister to be convicted of a crime while in office for breaching COVID rules, which became the long-running party gate saga. Johnson was fired from his job as a reporter of the Times of London and again from a ministerial post for lying about a love affair. He once said he wanted to be world king. That was when he was a child. And OK, it wasn't quite the world, but soon the crown of UK Prime Minister will be gone. To you, the British public, I know that there will be many people who are relieved and uh, perhaps quite a few who will also be disappointed. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. So where do ambition and overambition collide? Does it take an extraordinary character or a flawed character to aspire to the highest elected office anywhere in the land? And as the British people wait to see who takes over, Thank what you. mistakes should, indeed must, the new Prime Minister avoid? On this round table, we have out of Reading to the west of London, Rob Wilson, former Conservative MP for that town. We head to Inverness in Scotland and say hello to Lord Clive Soley, former Labour MP, now a member of the House of Lords, and with me in the studio, Ivor Gaber, Professor of Political Journalism at the University of Sussex. Um, I'm going to hold up a front page from the Irish Examiner from 2019. Political careers often end in failure, but few fail as spectacularly as Theresa May's. Ivor, we may have a new candidate for the top spot of failures. It's, it's quite a crowded podium, that is. Um, Mrs Thatcher failed spectacularly, left Downing Street tearfully. Winston Churchill, the great war hero, was kicked out by the electorate. As um, Enoch Powell, a former Conservative MP in this country, said, all political careers end in failure, with the obviously honourable exception of my two fellow guests. Well, there was a caveat to that. There was a bit in the middle of what Enoch Powell said, in which he said, unless there is a happy ending prematurely, or something like that. And this wasn't happy, was it? No, um, we're, talk we're talking about Boris Johnson. It's been a, a Shakespearean dramatic fall. Um, here was this man who seemed untouchable and almost by his own hand and out of his own mouth. He's created a crisis in his own, in his own party. Um, and his fall from grace has been, in a matter of hours, it's been spectacular political television. But the stream of resignations over the last 48 hours and then people who resigned coming back because he said he'll do it um, on an interim basis has been quite remarkable. I've never seen anything like this before. Clive, what do you make of a character who ends up in that position? Well, I think the problem for Boris was integrity, in one word. He lacked integrity. I think politics is a tough old trade. I don't accept the, that they all end in failure, frankly. In a democratic system, you have successes, you have failures, and yet how it ends can be very painful and embarrassing. And for Boris, I, you'd think it would be, but he doesn't seem to notice the embarrassment. I knew Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London. I've known every British prime minister since Harold Wilson. I've respected all of them except Boris. And the reason I don't respect Boris is the reason he's fallen out of favour so dramatically. It is because he has been profoundly dishonest. And politics is difficult around the area of honesty. There is always you know, difficult lines to be drawn. But he was so profoundly dishonest that he very rapidly lost the trust of the British people. And from there on, the spotlight was suddenly on him and people saw the problem that he paid the price for that. Are you suggesting that there are degrees of rottenness? Because lying as a politician should not be tolerated, presumably, in any case. I know not everybody is a George Washington, but if you can't trust your politicians, does it matter 
whether they lie a lot or a little? It does, yes. I mean, the reality is none of us in, in politics or otherwise go through life without lying. We all know that there are circumstances where you conceal the truth or you, you know, you say something different to what you'd rather say because the circumstances otherwise are too bad. I could give examples of that in politics, usually when it in a military situation or the economy is in big trouble or something of that nature. But what Boris was doing, which was fundamentally different, and I knew it when he was mayor of London, he was saying one thing to one group of people and something exactly opposite to the other groups of people. And it was noticeable that he didn't seem to care about it. Whereas I'd have been going home saying, you know, could I could I have done that differently? How could I do that? But Boris didn't. He just sort of thought, I can get away with this. And of course, for a long time he did, but then it all unraveled over the so-called party gate scandal, where it was very obvious that he was lying. Rob, let me come to you, because I want to bring you all in at the very beginning of this programme. What Clive Soley has just said. Is that a character flaw? Does that make somebody a serial liar? Or is it somebody who just wants to please, saying one thing to one group of people because that's what they want to hear, and another thing to another group of people because that's what they want to hear? Well, Boris certainly had many character flaws, and I think Clive is, is reasonably fair in that... Uh, Boris did have uh, problems with telling the truth all the time. And I think there were three specific P's that brought him down. The Patterson affair, um, Partygate, and also Pincher. So the three P's did for um, Boris in the end. And it was his lack of candour that an, that an integrity that really led to the problem. But it wasn't just that. Boris also had problems with policy. Um, there were too many in the Conservative Party that felt that Boris wasn't actually delivering conservative economic policy with low taxes and control on spending. And they felt that he was very much delivering a much more Gordon Brown style of um, economic policy. And that was a big, big problem with the electoral base in the Conservative Party and also backbench MPs. I'll come back, to you, in a jiffy. You I'll come back to you in a jiffy, if I may, because I want... Give some more meat to those things that you've mentioned. I'm going to run through a few successes and failures of Boris Johnson and we'll bring up Partygate, etc. and Pincher. Here, here we go. Uh, what did he get right? Well, I suppose that's uh, up to you to decide, but he was praised for removing the UK from the European Union. In other words, getting Brexit done. He oversaw one of the most successful COVID vaccination programmes anywhere in the world. He showed strong support for Ukraine, as many other leaders have done. But these are some of his failures as identified by others. September 2021, breaking the, breaking the 2019 manifesto pledge not to raise taxes to pay for the NHS and social care. The wallpaper gate, as it became known, £112,000 plus on a Downing Street flat refurbishment. £850 a roll, gold wallpaper. Where did the money come from? Party gate, you mentioned it. The string of Downing Street parties during COVID lockdowns that threatened to topple Mr Johnson more than once. He's been fined once so far, but could face more fines, accused of attending five more parties, being investigated by police. It is a long list. I make no apologies for that. He faced the damning verdict of an initial report into Partygate, which said the gatherings marked what it described as a failure of leadership and were difficult to justify. And Chris Pincher, Rob, you mentioned him. Allegations by Conservative MPs and activists of inappropriate behaviour by a senior minister, that is Chris Pincher, which go back 21 years, raising the question of what Boris Johnson knew and if he knew about these allegations when he gave the MP Chris Pincher the job of deputy chief whip. Um, do you think there are successes which will be remembered, Ivor, or will it simply be the, the mistakes? I think um, Johnson's personality is so big um, and the lying is part of that personality, I think that is how posterity will remember him. Um, to, be, to allow my own political views to intrude, I don't think in 20 years' time we'll look back and see taking Britain out of the EU was such a good move. So I think he will not get brownie points for that. I think we will look and see that the achievements you, you, you mentioned are far outweighed by... And I would say the biggest black mark against him is the fact, and both Clive 
as Clive made reference to it, he has lowered the standard of public life in this country significantly. The, there's always been a certain cynicism about politicians, they're all the same, etc. But Johnson has introduced a level of dishonesty into our public debate, which I've never seen before, and I think that will be his and, legacy. And do you think, Rob, I interrupted you, I'll come back to you for just a moment before I talk to Slive. Do you think that is now accepted as the norm? And if that is the case, how can that be changed so we get a level of probity back in British public life that um, Ivor's saying we, we should have a right to expect? So what's happened is very unusual. And Boris has um, been an exception rather than the rule. Uh, his character is completely different from any prime minister, I think, that we've seen uh, in 200 years. And I think that that has meant that we have seen something extraordinary. He's an extraordinary campaigner. You know, he, he won Brexit. He delivered a huge majority, did all those things. But... To do that, he had a very different character to John Major, Theresa May, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown. And he was a risk taker in a way that probably we haven't seen as a prime minister before. And those things all caught up with him. And being a risk taker, it meant that he didn't always tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But it, I honestly believe it was an exception to the rule. Were you excited? I know you left Parliament in 2017, therefore you were never likely to be part of the, these Boris Johnson years. But I'm sure you know of him and, and probably know him. Were you ever excited at the prospect of him being leader of the Conservative Party and then Prime Minister? Well, I didn't vote for him. I voted for Jeremy Hunt. Um, so he wasn't my choice as leader. OK, but once it became However, a fait accompli, was, was there a certain frisson? He had delivered Brexit. He had got Brexit through the House of Commons. And so there was a feeling that he could actually deliver some monumental things for this country. But that quickly became apparent that uh, the way he behaved at the centre of Downing Street was he wanted to do everything. He wanted to control everything. He wanted to pull levers that would suddenly lead to action. And of course, anyone who's been in government understands that government doesn't work like that. You have to work through the different, um, the different um, departments of state, and you have to trust your secretaries of state to deliver day in, day out. And he wasn't doing that, so everything ground to a halt. And that isn't good government, and that's one of the problems that he had. Yeah, Clive, you left um, the House of Commons in 2005, I think it was, went up to the House of Lords. You've been around a long time. I hope you won't mind me saying so. Do you recognise this in any of the other politicians that you've looked at from afar? Michael Heseltine, former Deputy Prime Minister under Margaret Thatcher, said of Boris Johnson, he is a man who waits to see which way the crowd is running and then dashes in front and says, follow me. Does that simply mean he's not a conviction politician? And do you have to be to be successful? I think the thing to remember about Boris, leave aside the honesty bit, which I think is a really big issue, actually, because the British have always been quite proud of their sort of, uh, of a level of integrity in their system, which has been uh, uh, undermined. Leave that aside for a moment and look at the policy issues which you and Rob have mentioned. I think Rob's basically right. If I was saying what the criticism of Boris was, he had a strategy in the sense that he wanted to get out of the European Union because that's what he thought the public wanted. But he didn't have the ability then to deliver it in a sensible way. I, I voted Remain, but I can see that you could make Brexit work. But Brock Boris couldn't make it work. And, and, and we've ended up in a position where we're constantly having a fight with the European Union, which is a bad position for the European Union and a bad position for Britain. But we can get over that. But his tactics just don't... Uh, enable him to do that. And he's always is a bit, as uh, Michael Hesseltine indicated, looking at which way the crowd's going and then trying to jump in front of him. Yeah, I, I don't know which was the first um, Prime Minister that you looked at from afar as an aspiring politician. Um, and then you went through to 2005. I'd like you to identify the gold standard and the character traits that are necessary for that and compare that to what we've seen with the... UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson? That's quite a difficult one. You certainly have to be ambitious. There's no doubt about that. You have to want the job. You 
you have to have a view of where you want Britain to be. And I think Boris had that as well. Uh, but you also have to have, um, and I could see that, you know, I, I lack this, if you like, was the ability to work with the whole of your political group in a way that actually delivered the outcome that you wanted. And Boris couldn't do that. What he's done is alienate many of his own supporters. Most of those people who told him he must go now were strong supporters only, a, you know, a year or two ago. So he lost it. It wasn't just about the dishonesty over party gate and so on. It was also because, as Rob has indicated, there was a lack of direction for the Tory party. And there's a very real possibility that first time in my lifetime, the Tory party could split because it's it's going in two different directions at the same time. I suppose it very much that. depends who, who the new leader is, and we won't know that um, for a little while. Ivor, you, you've been in journalism for a very long time. You, you've written this um, pamphlet, would I call it, yeah, which yeah. you hope or believe may well be published as a book, called Strategic Lying and Permission to Lie. What does that mean? Well, um, starting, I suppose, well, I then looked back at Trump, but it didn't start with Trump. Brexit, and forgive me for going back to um, those days, but there was a big red bus which had, we send the EU 350 million a week, let's spend it on the NHS. Whose and idea so, was that? I don't know. It Lyndon may well Crosby. have been Boris Johnson's. Well, he certainly capitalised on it. And it was a very effective slogan. Um, I called it, that started me thinking, and there were other examples which I won't detain you. What is a strategic lie? All politi do all politicians lie? Not knowingly, they certainly, um, glass is very half full and certainly not half empty. They certainly spin as much as they can. But um, this, this 350 million figure, what it achieved, whether it was true or not, and it was, there was a scintilla of truth about it, a scintilla. That was our gross overall bill. It didn't take into account any of our repayments, any of our discounts, so forth. Um, but what it did, it drove the news agenda for many weeks. It made the cost of our membership of the EU the central issue, which was bound to be a very good issue for the Leave campaign, because why does anybody want to spend money if they don't have to? But you're a journalist, but and it was did... it not the fault of the media that well, that happened? Let me, let me just tell you briefly a story. When the b b bus was launched, um, ITM, one of the main broadcasters, um, the prime newsreader, Tom Bradby, a fine journalist, spent eight minutes interviewing Boris Johnson in the back of the bus and did a fantastic demolition job on the 350 million figure. But the Leave campaign and Boris Johnson must have been delighted because there for eight minutes on the top of one of the main bulletins, the discussion was how much it cost us. Whether it was true or not was irrelevant. And that became one of the dominant issues. And that started me looking and investigating. And we saw other, the whole point of a strategic lie is to not just tell an untruth, it's to shape the news agenda. Is it the fault of journalists? In an election campaign, journalists have to report what politicians are talking about, even if it's to challenge it. And that's nothing, that's what, that's, Democratic politics requires us to report. Here, here is perhaps, and I'll come to you, Rob, an example of that going back 12 years. I will tell you who the author was at the end of this. The whole thing, this is about Gordon Brown being Prime Minister and refusing, one said, to, to leave Downing Street. The whole thing's unbelievable. As I write these words, Gordon Brown is still holed up in Downing Street. He's like some illegal settler in the Sinai Desert, lashing himself to the radiator. And you know who that was. That was Boris Johnson writing, I think, for the, for the Daily Telegraph. And the point is, and I mentioned this with Ivor just now, that you need to have people to amplify your thoughts, i.e., in this case, the Daily Telegraph. It's not necessarily your own ambitions. It's the fact that news has to keep going. So it's not necessarily Boris's fault. Well, I think that Ivor's been a bit unfair in that uh, what he said was singling out Boris as if he's the author of all the untruths no, no, told me, in politics. No, no, forgive me, forgive me. It wasn't Boris <laughs> Linton Crosby. It was his strategic <laughs> advisers, not him. He was merely the puppet. OK, quick correction on air. Thank you very much indeed. Rob, carry on. OK, well, well, well I mean, you could go back to the real poisoning of uh, the communications environment in politics took place under Alistair Campbell and Tony Blair with dodgy dossiers and God knows what. So... You, there's always been lies in politics, there's always been debates, there's always been people wanting to get their own 
uh, coverage in the newspapers and on the TV. So I wouldn't say this is anything to do with Boris particularly uh, and the Brexit debate because there were there were disinformation on both sides. Let's put it that way. But I, I do think the, the issue with Boris it is quite a serious one. And that's why the Conservative Party did have to get rid of him in the end, because at the end of the day, this country wants to be seen as one of great integrity, decency, honesty. And Boris had let the country down on those issues and had let the Conservative Party down. And that's why you saw so many people in his cabinet and elsewhere turn against him. Well, isn't it a case of, as he put it, the herd turning against you? Once there's a stampede, it's almost impossible to stop. My question is, once those members of the herd realised that there was a momentum, they perhaps thought, this is the best thing I can do, as opposed to thinking two, three weeks ago or a couple of months ago, this is something I must do right now. They were as guilty of being duplicitous as perhaps he was. Well, I think that uh, there were a number of MPs, and particularly uh, senior MPs and cabinet ministers, that should have seen the writing on the wall much earlier than they did. Um, it's all very well giving a, uh, someone a second and possibly even a third chance, but a fourth, fifth, sixth chance, you know they're not going to change. And Boris himself said at one point he wasn't going to change. It was too late for him to, for the leopard to change his spots. And at that point, that should have rang alarm bells throughout the party. But I just think that what Boris did is he gathered himself around himself in cabinet, people who were friends rather than people that would would challenge him that would be constructive critics of his and that would um, stand up on their own areas of policy that they felt strongly about there were too many um, easy days for Boris in terms of his cabinet and not enough questions asked by them and I think that's that let him down really and he should have and he should have known that it's better to have tall poppies rather than short grass around you. OK, Clive, we've got about five minutes left. I'm going to ask you something I mentioned at the beginning about the future for this country and the next Prime Minister. Do we need somebody who is diametrically opposite to Boris Johnson in character? I'm not asking you to identify a particular person, but who is not all of the things that you've described him as being. And if we do get that, are we in danger of getting somebody who thinks the most exciting thing they've ever done in life is run through a wheat field, as we saw with the previous Prime Minister? Yes, I will be looking, I think, for someone who can offer some stability. The problem for the current government, the Tory party at the moment, they are heading in two different directions. There's two wings of that party. That is what normally happens in the Labour Party. Someone said once that the Tory party was a, a conspiracy to stay in power. And I always thought, yes, the Labour Party is a conspiracy to stay out of power. The reality is that we've almost switched roles at the moment. The Tory party is splitting and going in different directions. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult for them to pull that back together, which is why I think they're still in trouble. Um, Ivor, yes. let me ask you, Strategic Lying, your, your treatise, which you hope will be published as a book, if you were to be able to give advice to the future Prime Minister of this country on what lesson you can learn about Strategic Lying or not lying strategically, what would it be? Well, I would say the, the, the first rule of lying is don't get caught. So always give yourself some wriggle room. But it's important, new, trying to control the news agenda, as we, we call it, is important. You know, Labour's got its issues that it wants to be prominent in an election campaign, and the Conservatives have got their issues. So that's quite legitimate. The advice I would give, I think um, integrity, or and I'm going to be cynical here, the appearance of integrity is very important. Trust is always a very important factor when pollsters are trying to analyse why people vote. So it's appearing to be trustworthy. But you've got to be a little bit cynical and try and control the news agenda. I actually take a slightly moral line. I don't think politicians should lie. I don't think they should tell but things I'm interested. they know not you, to be you, true. You said you must appear as though you have integrity. Yeah. You must not get caught lying. Yeah, well, Do we all have to be as cynical as that these days? Um, I think politician, politics is a dirty game. Um, and, yeah, I think um, cynicism with integrity, there's my catchword. Cynicism with integrity. Okay, quick word from you, Rob. Um, what do you think about those definitions of a future leader of this country? Well, I want someone with experience and I want somebody who, with honesty and integrity in the Conservative Party. And I just think that Clive misunderstands the Conservative Party if he thinks it's going to split. What's happened is the Conservative Party doing what it always does when it's in trouble is it 
brings in a new leader and it focuses on how it goes about winning. And that's why the Conservative Party has been the most successful party of government that there's ever been in this country. And where will Boris Johnson world? stand on that list of, OK, the most successful party of the most successful leaders? Where does he stand? One to 50. Right down the bottom? I don't think he's at the bottom, but he's he's going to be close to the bottom. What I would say is the Conservative Party has provided two of the worst prime ministers uh, of the last uh, 50, 60 years. OK, um, we'll, we'll, have we'll have to see. We'll have to see. We'll have to see whether that is the case uh, the next time around. Sorry to cut you short, but we're out of time. Thank you very much indeed, as uh, Boris Johnson was uh, just a few hours ago. Listen, thank you very much for watching this edition of Roundtable from me, David Foster, uh, from my guests. We hope to have your company next time. Until then, goodbye.